section 8.7, we look briefly at unbounded Keplerian orbits. It turns out that when epsilon is equal to or greater than 1, you can get a radial distance between our two gravitating bodies that becomes unbounded. In other words, the two are not locked in an orbit around one another, and they may just have a short close encounter before wandering off and never encountering one another again. So coming back to our equation for an orbit, r of phi, uh, we find that if the epsilon value, the eccentricity for our orbit, is 1, then as phi approaches pi, 1 minus cos phi is going to go to, to 0. And when that happens, of course, r is going to approach infinity. In other words, the radial distance between the two gravitating objects is going to become infinite. What does that look like? And so here's what the orbit uh, looks like when epsilon is equal to 1. There's a well-defined closest approach distance, of course, r min. And that's just going to be that constant c divided through by 1 plus epsilon, because phi is going to be 0 during, during closest approach, and so that's going to be c over 2. So r min is still well-defined, uh, even in the case that epsilon uh, is 1. However, as phi goes toward pi, we see that r needs to go to infinity. And so it heads out in this direction. We say they would have, uh, if we reverse the evolution of phi, passing through phi equals 0 and going back into negative values, we see that you also head out to infinity. And so for epsilon equal 1, this represents uh, what's called a parabolic encounter between our two gravitating bodies. Um, and we'll, we'll see in a second the difference between a parabolic encounter, where the uh, orbital energy is exactly equal to zero, and what's called a hyperbolic encounter, where the orbital energy is greater than zero. So let's see what that looks like in a second. So let's see how the energy is related to the geometric parameters epsilon and c for our orbit. Recall from earlier sections that the total energy of the orbit uh, we can cast it in terms of uh, radial motion, r dot, uh, phi motion, phi dot, and then the potential energy. Um, when r is equal to r min, you can see by looking at the orbital motion we just described, r dot has to be zero. In other words, uh, when the objects come to their point of closest approach during their orbit, they're not going to get any close to one another, and for that instant, they're not moving apart uh, radially from one another. So in, 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 that, in that case, r dot is exactly equal to zero when r is equal to r min. So we can make that replacement to calculate uh, e. And you can see we get a bunch of r mins in a lot of places. Here, of course, we've taken the potential energy associated with gravity, gamma over r. And so all of this equals this. So that tells us our energy is equal to this expression. Well, remember, r min is given by c, the constant, over 1 plus epsilon, and remember we defined c to be this constant here, and so we can plug all of this in for r min. Uh, there's a little bit of algebra involved that the book walks through, but the upshot of all of this is that the total energy of the orbit, the potential plus the kinetic energy, uh, is given by this expression here. And so you can see that the energy for an orbit is related to the eccentricity epsilon squared minus 1. And so we see that the energy of our orbit is proportional to epsilon squared minus 1. And so we can see that epsilon essentially sets the nature of the orbit. For epsilon between 0 and 1, we have an orbit which is either circular, in which case epsilon is exactly 0, or epsilon is, is between 0 and 1. That's an ellipse. And that corresponds, we can see, to an energy less than 0. Well, the total energy less than 0, that means that the gravitational potential energy, which is negative, dominates over the kinetic energy, which is always positive. And therefore, we know that when energy is less than zero, we're in a bound orbit. So circles and ellipses, those are bound orbits. When epsilon is exactly equal to one, I've already made the point that this corresponds to a parabolic orbit, and we can see that the total energy associated with the orbit in that case is exactly equal to zero. In other words, the total kinetic energy is equal 
an opposite in sign to the potential energy. The two exactly balance out. This represents an orbit that's just unbound. This actually, uh, this orbit lies at the separatrix between bound and unbound orbits. So the two objects will have a close encounter and then move out to our, uh, move out toward our infinity and just run out of kinetic energy as they get out to our equal infinity. So the orbit is considered just unbound. Finally, if you have an epsilon greater than 1, uh, as I've already told you, this corresponds to a hyperbolic orbit. And you can show that uh, using some of the homework problems, the difference between the parabolic and hyperbolic orbits. In any case, when epsilon is greater than 1, we see that the total energy of the system is greater than 0. In other words, the kinetic energy dominates over the gravitational binding energy, and so the orbit is unbound. And so this uh, relationship uh, of the, ex the energy of the orbit and the eccentricity of the orbit, that sets whether we have a bound orbit or an unbound orbit. So it's really critical to know what the energy for the orbit is, and that actually tells us what kind of orbit we have.